Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Fran Johnson, Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG. Welcome to this edition of CIO Leadership Live. I'm joined today by the Chief Digital Officer and Executive VP of JetBlue Airways, and we're going to have a lot of fun talking for the next 45 minutes or so. Our broadcast that you're watching is at, is streaming live right now onto Twitter and to YouTube to our IDG Tech Talk channel. And then also, and this is new today, onto LinkedIn to our CIO.com page on LinkedIn. It's our first experience streaming live onto LinkedIn as well as Twitter and YouTube. So please take advantage of this opportunity since you're here live and part, you can be part of this conversation. Just you can post a comment and we're watching for all that. And if you have a question directly for the Chief Digital Officer of JetBlue, I will be able to throw it his way. So let me do a, uh, a more formal introduction. Ish Sundaram is the Executive Vice President and Chief Digital and Technology Officer at JetBlue Airways. In addition to his executive VP and his CDO role, Ish is also serving as the oversight officer for JetBlue Technology Ventures, which is a Silicon Valley-based subsidiary that invests in early stage technologies that are focused in the travel, hospitality, and technology industries. As a member of the airline's executive leadership team, Ish is responsible for all technology strategy and the digital transformation efforts that are being felt by customers of the airline, and I think there's something like 40 million of us over time, and then more than 22,000 crew members. He also leads JetBlue's Innovation Hub. Before he joined JetBlue early in 2012, Ish served as the CIO and the Global Supply Chain Officer for Paul Corporation, a New York-based biotech business. Before that, he held a variety of global leadership positions in technology and operations with McKesson Corporation, i2 Technologies, and ALK Technologies. Among the many awards and honors he has amassed over the years are two very recent ones. This past May, each won the 2019 MIT Sloan CIO Leadership of the, of the Year Award, and last year, we inducted him into our CIO Hall of Fame. Thank you so much for joining me here today, Ish. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Mary Friend. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, live from our Long Island City Support Center, it's an honor and pleasure to be uh, in the show. Okay, wonderful. Let's start out. I often do this with our CIO guests where we take a we go 30,000 feet above the world today, which is so appropriate for you at JetBlue. And we talk about the disruption that you see going on in the industry and what kind of an impact you're feeling from that on the competitive landscape. So talk kind of place that for us about how JetBlue is looking at that landscape these days. You know, um, a Mary friend, if you know, we always share this. Uh, when you think about uh, aviation, commercial aviation started uh, January 1st, 1914. In 105 years of commercial aviation, uh, the first flight, uh, St. Petersburg to Tampa, uh, in 105 years, this industry has seen more challenges than opportunities. And you think about uh, in, mm. in 105 years, we've seen mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcies. And, and JetBlue is very proud to say we are one of the airlines that has survived and, and thrived uh, in two decades without going through one of them. And, and, uh, and the first thing, uh, when we look at our strategy in terms of uh, our customer experience, we say it has to be personal, helpful, and simple. And, and there's mm -hmm. two things that matters the most for us. One is a great culture, 22,000 um, solid crew members who you know, deliver that experience day in and day out, and also a great technology platform that gives the tools to our customers and our crew members to deliver that experience. Okay. Well, one of the things you and I have talked about was the is the importance of future proofing the JetBlue brand, and um, with all the stress and the economic cycles and things that you mentioned, uh, technology drives a lot of enablement there. But when you talk about future proofing the brand, uh, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, when you when you think about our industry, uh, aviation is very asset heavy and very cyclical. Uh, for us to future-proof JetBlue as a brand, we look, look at things beyond just buying new planes and also grow asset late uh, in the next decade. 
And uh, you know, technology has been a key enabler for us. And when you look at the the product expansion, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's our uh, JetBlue travel products, that's a newly owned subsidiary of JetBlue, uh, we're bringing in a lot of uh, expansion into the travel driven on asset late products that is grow- going to grow the JetBlue footprint. One of the other things that you and I have talked about about the mission of JetBlue is the the future being turning more into a travel company versus an airline. I mean, running an airline is tough enough, but to expand the brand and to future-proof it, uh, when you become more of a travel company, how does that happen, and and what does that mean exactly? Yeah, um, when you when you think about uh, you know uh, the the industry itself. Um, we look at, uh, you know, growing beyond just selling tickets for us as a great opportunity for us to expand that product portfolio in the travel ribbon. Generally, people come and buy uh, an airline ticket. They most likely buy a hotel and a car, but there are many, many opportunities for us to grow that footprint for the 45 million customers we fly by building in uh, tech products that are really asset late and and much quicker to deploy rather than buying hard products like expanding our planes and you know airports uh, so uh, our jetblue ventures has been a rock solid support for us in terms of disrupting that space uh, when you think about silicon valley it's full of ideas we want to be in front of disruption rather than being at the back of being disrupted and and future proofing for us is to expand our product portfolio you know, I, I go back saying this, mm-hmm. when JetBlue was founded, uh, our, our our founders used to say JetBlue is a customer service company, happens to fly planes. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, I think we're redefining that to be a, a travel tech company in the customer service business and flying planes happens behind the scenes for us. Yes. You know, I remember the very first time I ever heard a CIO talking that way. It was probably back in the 1990s and I was with Computer World then and we were at one of our events and I had the CIO of United Airlines on and on stage and he was, CIOs even then were still we're talking about that kind of that future eventuality that they would become eventually a company that flew airplanes or that uh, happened to fly airplanes, but they were really at their heart a technology company. I think it's a lot, it's probably much more true today than it was back in the 1990s. But how does that have an impact on the role that you have? You have a much broader role than just CIO. You're a chief digital officer. You're running a Silicon Valley startup. Um, could you have envisioned when you joined in 2012 that the role you have today would, would have expanded its own brand so much? You know, yeah, JetBlue, uh, you know, I look back at JetBlue's uh, history. You know, innovation has been in our DNA. Um, technology has been a core uh, enabler for JetBlue since day one, when this company actually started with live televisions in the seat back. Uh, think about a, a flying object with, you know, at 500 miles per hour, you know, putting in live televisions uh, 20 years ago. That was a great uh, innovation. And over the course of many years, if you think about the Wi-Fi, the satellite that we launched in partnership with Viasat, we've always taken a very contrarian approach in terms of driving innovation. And uh, you know uh, what 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 I did and my team did was to supercharge that effort into you know building in more products that are tech enabled and uh, mm-hmm. you know driving a very personalized uh, travel experience for our customers and also giving the tools to our crew members to deliver that seamless personal experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think uh, when I look back at uh, you know uh, our technology ventures or or the travel products uh, you know uh, uh, spinoff, I think. Everything is tech enabled. It just carries into the history of like the innovative thinking that we have had. And our job uh, and my role in the organization is to uh, help deliver that experience and supercharge that as, as technology programs, uh, you know, the useful life is shrinking and the speed to market has to be rapid. That's what my team's doing here. Okay. All right, good. And we'll get it we'll get a little bit later we'll get into how you have the team structured because you have a very interesting structure that you've done with the whole technology mission. But we have a question from our faithful listeners right now. Uh, they'd like to know what are the main digital transformation challenges that face the airline industry? 
Yeah, the biggest uh, opportunity we have, uh, we, we, we never look at everything as a challenge, we look at it as opportunity. Um, you know, as much as complexity that exists behind the, uh, behind the uh, scenes in aviation industry, um, you know, our mission to drive personal, helpful, simple customer experience has given us an opportunity to eliminate things that doesn't really add value to the customer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, oftentimes people think that it's more technology is what is needed to the customer. It's actually the opposite. People want less technology, more personalized, much simpler footprint to operate. And, you know, over the last four years, we've taken an opportunity not just to look at a technical lens, but also look at the people aspect and the process aspect to drive that kind of a technology deployment in here. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say this, we want airports to be a transitional airport experience, not a transactional airport experience. And it's really uh, driving that interaction with our customers Mm-hmm. Uh, is what matters to us, less of a technology uh, focus. It's more of how do you drive that human experience? Well, and I think that as an, uh, a frequent flyer on various airlines, especially on JetBlue, um, I've noticed, I think we've all noticed that a lot of the the desks have disappeared, that you're more likely to walk into this open area with kiosks and to have people in their JetBlue uniforms come up and ask you, how can they help you? And it really is something you appreciate in an airport because it's that human face on the technology. It's a little bit ironic because behind the scenes, there's more technology than ever. But the thing that customers really like is to see less of it. You know, it's interesting, uh, Mayor Friend. Uh, You know, uh, we all travel, so it's easy to uh, translate our experiences into what you do for your living, right? Yeah. And 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 if you ask uh, the ten people who travel, the number one thing they say is. We want no lines. We want less, you know, transaction. Nobody wants to stand in a line and print a copy of their boarding pass. So we're trying to make this very seamless. The airport and and, and the day of travel experience is where we focus the most of our energy on Mm -hmm. driving self-service. But not just self-service. We we definitely don't want to take our problems and give it to our customers and say, (laughs) transaction. You solved this. That's the old way of. Mm-hmm. That's the old way of self-service, right? Our new way of self-service is really making it personal, helpful, and simple. Mm-hmm. Okay, that sounds like that sounds like it's probably everybody's motto in the company, right? Right. Now, you had mentioned that the JetBlue Ventures plays into uh, all of this this customer-centric focus plays into it big time. Was the way you put it? There's JetBlue Travel Products, which was created a year ago. Tell me a bit more about that, how the ventures, how the venture arm is adding to this whole strategy. Yeah, uh, when, when you think about uh, an industry that is being disrupted, um, you know, there's a lot of new players in the marketplace who wants to come and play in our space. Uh, think about the Uber, think about the Airbnbs, the Amazons, a lot of large players are coming into the space. But then when you also go into Silicon Valley, at any point in time, there's like 28,000 startups that potentially will disrupt our, our space. Uh, we, we as a company, as I said, we are very innovative. We want to be in front of everything than being disrupted. So um, we uh, started our own um, you know, venture capital fund, which, which is headquartered in Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. uh, which basically drives the innovation within JetBlue. Um, you know, being in front of it, we help, you know, kind of uh, drive that market into the future versus being, you know, disrupted and uh, have to fight hard uh, in a defensive move. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's actually helped us a lot in terms of how we look at expanding the product portfolio beyond just being an airline into travel tech hospitality space. But also within JetBlue, a lot of these tools and technologies that is coming in is changing the way how we price a ticket. It's changing the way how we manage weather. Mm -hmm. It's changing the way how we run our legal department. Every single department within JetBlue is looking at innovation as how we built this company for the future rather than following a legacy path. Okay. Well, and uh, you also mentioned you've got 28 different companies now in the portfolio for JetBlue Ventures. Correct. Um, So uh, we started our ventures in 20... uh, 16 formally. Uh, in, in, in the last three years, we've invested about uh, 
officially, at least publicly stated, about 28 plus companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing is, uh, we always say we're not a bank to just invest in these companies. That's not the purpose of uh, mm -hmm. why we started our ventures. It's more about how we change the way we do business. How do we build new products? Um, about 30% of these companies uh, we, we would consume in the first year of investments and, mm -hmm. and change the way we do business today. So a lot of these companies I'm talking about, whether it's uh, Flyer Labs or Gladly or Climate Cell, uh, Shape Security, these are companies actually that is powering a lot of innovation in JetBlue. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, we have another question. You're incredibly popular today. We we often get out there <laughs> pitching that people can ask questions over Twitter, and and then it's crickets. We don't hear anybody. They just I think get fascinated just listening. But this question is about what is your strategy to monetize the digital assets that you gain during the traveler journey? Since we're thinking about travelers and and uh, and the way they interact with JetBlue and how that's changing. What's your strategy to monetize all those digital assets? Well, um, if you, if you know, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, sure if I understand the question specific, but let me let me uh, try out two different views on this. Okay. Uh, we clearly value um, our customer data and the privacy around it. We will never compromise anything on privacy of our customer data. So, you know, when it comes to monetization, we are extremely sensitive to you know, monetizing our customer data. We would not do that. Okay. Uh, where we uh, really think our investments are helping is having a great brand like JetBlue, uh, being able to be a launch customer on these investments for them gives them a great platform to build a great company. Mm -hmm. Such as, you know, when we started with like Gladly, they had probably a handful of customers. Now with the JetBlue brand and the success they've had in the ventures, uh, they, they have expanded their customer base significantly. So our investments returns that, you know, benefit uh, longer term um, in mm -hmm. terms of the, the multiplayer factor. But in terms of our digital assets, um, you know, we carry about 40 to 45 million customers average a year. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them just buy a ticket. And, uh, and our, right. we call them the attach rates. Uh, uh, the ancillary sales on top of, you know, our core, um, core airline ticket is relatively small. And our view is to build more products that our customers can buy beyond just a, 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 a air ticket. Mm -hmm. And that's really the focus on our JetBlue travel products, which is a asset late company that is building a lot of ancillary products mm -hmm. that you know we can really monetize our 45 million customer data that we have internally in JetBlue to sell them more more, um, you know, travel products than the travel ribbon. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's a good answer because I think it is very difficult. Uh, just the word monetize might sound like you're trying to turn customer data into, you know, some sort of cash stream, but that seems very much the opposite of what you're doing with the strategy. Um, I, you've mentioned Gladly a few times. Talk a little bit about what Gladly is. Uh, I had to look it up. I hadn't heard of it before, although I may have already used some of the, I guess it's an omni-channel experience for travelers. Yeah, so Gladly is one of our investment companies. Uh, uh, it's a Greylock, uh, you know, sponsored company um, uh, headquartered in California. Um, think about when customers reach out to JetBlue, they can come through different channels. You book a ticket, you know, you call JetBlue, you can come through chat, a telephone line, an email, a text message. There's so many different ways customers communicate back to us. Uh, and, and, and in the past, we, we didn't really connect all the dots between different modes of communication into one uh, view, single view of the customer. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Gladly does. Basically, it builds a conversation around all the multiple interaction a customer has with us. Mm -hmm. In reality, what took us 15, 20 minutes to answer a phone call because we had to go do research behind the scenes when anyone calls us, now we have the 360 view of the customer instantaneously in front of our customer support people, which rapidly solves the problem for them in terms of how we address the issues. And that's, the, that's what the tool does for us. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, let's shift over into talking about the customer expectations and how those are changing. What sort of a shift have you seen in your eight years with the airline now? Well, uh, the uh, the challenges in the industry is uh, people need quick answers and quick, quick solutions. Yeah. 
Um, unlike many other industries, when, when somebody is stuck at the airport due to weather or mechanical or whatever it is, their choices are very limited in terms of, you know, what they can do to continue with their journey. Mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a rapid response is expected, but the response cannot be, there is a problem, we are working on it. It has to be a solution that we need to provide. And these technology tools give enormous amount of visibility for us, not just the problem, but also choices for us with solutions that we can offer. Not always there is one solution, there are multiple solutions in terms of how we you know, give that to our customers. And, and, and definitely that speed to response and, and the quality of response is what is uniquely changing in our industry. Okay. How do you go about measuring that, Ish? How, how, how do you know for sure that that's what's happening with your customers? Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, we do a good job with JetBlue is to measure our net promoter score. Um, you know, it's as simple as every, uh, every customer who flies us is given an opportunity to give us feedback on the, in terms of, you know, how we delivered that experience, uh, you know, pre, post, and uh, during the flight. That's that's as simple as that. And and the net promoter score is a direct measure of customer satisfaction, but we go deeper into every step of the uh, travel ribbon to measure the, uh, you know, the response of our customers, mm -hmm. the voice of the customers. And our net promoter score is pretty high for our industry in terms of, you know, where we stand in, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the high 50s, uh, you know, uh, uh, we compare ourselves uh, more towards the Googles and the Apples in terms of our net promoter score, not mm -hmm. a traditional airline industry, because uh, you know airline industry has never been known for service. Where you know where retail and 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 technology companies, the new generation companies, are known for service, and that's yeah. where we strive towards. Okay, uh, and we have you are incredibly popular today. We have another question, and this one is about, um, and it segues very nicely into what I wanted to talk about next about the IT organization. What sort of changes did you make to the IT organizational structure that helped you be more responsive to customers? And that really is congratulations to our audience members. It's an excellent question and one I had on my own list. So tell us about how you've got IT structured and why you've structured it that way with the customer in mind. It's interesting, Mayor Fran. When I look back, uh, you, know, you know, eight years of my tenure in, in JetBlue, uh, the first thing I say is don't fall in love with your strategy or your organizational design. I've heard it's you say that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changed multiple times. Uh, I don't think there is a perfect uh, organizational design for any organization. Mm -hmm. It has to fit the design of the organizational mission. Uh, here at JetBlue, uh, we, uh, we tend to avoid certain things like IT and business. Um, you know, uh, today technology is the business for us. Um, you know, everything, uh, you know, whether it's uh, our customer experience or operations or how we run this company is so, so dependent and enabled by technology. Um, so we have a slightly different organizational design in here that collapses uh, different functions into one group. So for example, uh, Mike Stromer leads our uh, product uh, Team. He's the chief product officer of JetBlue, mm -hmm. where we have brought in a lot of functions. We call them the matrix functions, like mm -hmm. from Mark, you know, Mike used to run our um, you know, e-commerce digital team uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. But we've merged that entire e-commerce digital team from start to finish into one integrated work group, which has helped us tremendously through our speed to market and cost to deliver. In the past, there was a lot of handoffs between commercial, marketing, and, and IT. Now it's all one integrated team under one leader that, mm -hmm. that has helped. We're trying to collapse things to make it faster, um, you know, less expensive, high quality products. Um, beneath this, I always say the fundamental thing that has helped us deliver this kind of a solid, you know, uh, platform is our crew members. Uh, and talent has become a such a such a critical part for us, um, especially with uh, new generation uh, technologies. Uh, you know, we've expanded our talent into a global footprint, and and and. You know, we go to the best place where we can find the best and brightest talent for us. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned, too, the, um, the integrated digital experiences, how those all come under one umbrella. Is that under your chief product officer or is our digital innovations a division of their own? So uh, yeah, the innovation lab and the uh, and the uh, product management function is under one um, you know one person, which mm -hmm. is uh, 
Mike Stromer, our chief product officer, who reports under me. Okay. And uh, we also have a very strong leadership uh, under Ramki uh, Ramaswamy, uh, driving the core technology development and architecture part, um, which never existed mm-hmm. in the past. Uh, you know, uh, many years ago. Uh, uh, you know, we always say this uh, in the past. Uh, you know, we used to buy a lot of, uh, you know, commodity products and, uh, you know, and deploy. Now we have so focused on building curated products for our customers and team yeah. members. So our internal development team um, has actually grown much larger and, and focus group than um, the, the previous decade of JetBlue. Mm-hmm. Well, and I um, and, uh, go ahead. And sorry, uh, one of the things that has changed everything for us is uh, the concept of Agile while most companies have leveraged Agile, you know, we've taken it to another level of, you know, deployment within JetBlue that we, we are absolutely seeing the benefits of Agile deployment mm-hmm. uh, in, in terms of the speed to market and, you know, the quality aspects of what we do. Yeah. Well, and what you were saying about expanding the internal development team, I, it immediately made me think of Agile because I think that it has driven a lot of those sorts of changes for companies. And I've heard that from other CIOs now, how much their hiring has changed. One of them told me that he's looking for people that want to build things rather than people that want to manage things. And that, you know, there's this whole kind of like diving in and getting your hands around it uh, that has come back. I, I love insourcing stories. We had a uh, last month at our CIO 100 uh, innovation conference. We had a, a, a particularly compelling story from GE, which all around the world insourced their help desk. Essentially, their support function for employees was something that they had 70 different vendors providing, and they recreated it and pulled it all in house. And it saved them a big ton of money, but it also changed their net promoter scores from a very negative number to a very positive one because of the way they had turned the digital transformation inside as well as external. I I tend to think over time that that's what marks a company that truly is transforming with technology, that it's not just about external customers, it's actually about the internal employees, the crew members. Absolutely, and Mm -hmm. and, and, and within JetBlue, we always say this, there is only two work groups within JetBlue people who serve the customer, we call them our frontline staff and mm-hmm. crew members, and uh, people who serve uh, our frontline crew members or support center people like us. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you, you, have to, you have to focus on owning your products. You have to focus on owning your relationship and, and delivery. Um, you know, and having the right partners is very important to us. We are very fortunate to have very good partners that help us deliver that experience. But mm-hmm. end of the day, I always say, uh, you know, the buck stops in our office and, you know, we mm-hmm. need to own that product delivery and the product quality. And that's yeah. what we do. Yeah. Well, and this actually segues very nicely into talking about data science, which may sound non-intuitive to our listeners, but as we were talking about the emerging tech trends and thinking about uh, the internal operations, you've got a lot that has happened with critical maintenance and crew planning and the kind of that behind the scenes running that happens at every airline. That is now very much a focus of your digital transformation efforts. Uh, Talk a little bit about that new function you created, you have data sciences under you now, and you mentioned a um, a 27-year-old data scientist from the New York Police Department that you brought in. Tell tell our listeners that story. I love that one. Uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, we have uh, Benjamin Singleton, who was the youngest ranking uh, non-uniformed uh, police officer. Uh, police director uh, who joined us recently, uh, mm-hmm. Yale graduate. Uh, he runs our data science team. Uh, uh, he modernized NYPD, uh, you know, data science uh, radically in the last five years. So we brought him on board. Here's the thing: uh, the new generation, uh, you know, uh, technologists are looking at technology as a toolkit versus a skill set. Uh, Benjamin, uh, you know, happens to be a liberal arts degree holder from Yale, but he is a very, very strong technologist in terms of leveraging machine learning AI as a toolkit versus just looking at it as a skill set, right? That's what we're tapping into. People with diverse experience, they come into our industry and they, you know, question this, question everything. And that's really the, you know, the the curiosity, the interest in us is 
such a fundamental thing that is needed to be in data science field. Mm -hmm. uh, the machine learning AI uh, basically turns this faster for them. But if you don't have the curiosity to ask, you know, different questions, the contrarian thinking, uh, the machines are not going to, you know, give you any set of different answers. Right. Um, so we're building this data science team with a very diverse skill set. What mm -hmm. is also changing is the machines themselves behind the scenes in airplanes, the engines, the uh, the technology that goes with it has enormous amount of data coming in now. Yes. The new generation, uh, you know, uh, engines that that we, you know, we are deploying in our fleet, like with the A three twenty one Neos and the A220 uh, platform gives us so much opportunity to do things different in terms of predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance. Uh, think about the largest, uh, one of the largest cost centers in, in JetBlue, it's our maintenance and uh, you know uh, maintenance function, mm -hmm. uh, several hundred billion dollars being spent in there. Even a fraction of uh, percentage of cost savings is huge to us uh, in terms yeah. of but also, uh, you know, we, we just don't do this because of cost saving. This is such an important thing for us in terms of driving safety uh, for mm -hmm. airlines and, and, and the, the amount of data that we collect and the ability to drive, uh, you know, our data science uh, programs on top is just going to make us much better operationally and also from a cost management standpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, you told me a story earlier about a uh, the way you could pick up on information that would prevent things like a plane getting stuck overnight in Havana, for instance. Uh, talk absolutely. about that a little bit. Uh, you, you know, uh, these uh, these engines have so much uh, forward-looking data. If you had the right set of people with the right set of eyes looking at it, um, you can prevent things from happening. Uh, most of these engines give you data worth, uh, you know, a week in advance that you can actually plan uh, certain maintenance proactively. So if I know a plane that needs a specific set of maintenance that's going to happen in the next three days, um, and if if we choose to hold that plane and do the maintenance three days early, I, it, it doesn't fly into Havana, a place like Havana, where we don't have a maintenance base, uh, and get stuck there. Now I have to send people, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, technicians, and we need to find another plane to bring the people back. All these things cost us enormous amount of money and impacts our customer um, experience. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at data science in terms of more so how to prevent things happening uh, rather than uh, reacting to it after it happens. Yeah. Well, the um, the long dr the the long held dream of predictive analytics, you know, data and analytics yes. <laughs> that can can give you some information that you can use right now that will actually help something going forward. Right. And, and uh, you know, when you think about predictive analytics uh, in the past, uh, you know, it was very prominent in the commercial space, right? People mm -hmm. managed revenue, people managed, uh, you know, uh, yield and different functions uh, within the commercial space. Uh, historically, in the operations side, it wasn't very prominent. And now we are seeing that come into the operations side. Mm -hmm. The um, one of the other, um, since I was thinking about your whole approach to innovation. And one of the companies that you mentioned a few times was Climacell, which is a weather predicting tool. And uh, tell me about how JetBlue has been using that. I know that's one of the companies JetBlue Ventures has is an investor in. Yeah, Climacell is a very innovative company founded by uh, a bunch of MIT uh, PhDs in data science and also their uh, former uh, fighter jet pilots mm -hmm. uh, who found a way to uh, you know, capture weather data from um, uh, from cell phone signals that transmits from one tower to another. Historically, radar uh, accuracy is uh, you know uh, farther beyond like a, a mile um, in radius and and not very accurate. That's the best technology we've seen so far. But when you start uh, monitoring precipitation through cell phone towers, you get such close you know, uh, range in terms of a few hundred feet uh, range to manage uh, weather uh, to a very high level of accuracy. Now think about airport diversions, planning for snow. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens by the minutes. It doesn't happen by the hour and, and days while we plan storms and other things by the days, but a thunderstorm coming into the neighborhood uh, where you have to divert a flight uh, literally happens in 15, 20 minutes and Climacell uh, technology gives us the opportunity to plan that close time window so it doesn't impact customer experience adversely or even safety uh, mm -hmm. gets enhanced. We are uh, 
working on uh, certain airports, uh, you know, driving an airport level efficiency program in terms of leveraging climate cell. Uh, we will be working closely with, uh, you know, our Federal Aviation Administration, uh, you know, to certify this product. It's, mm -hmm. it's currently being uh, tested uh, in, in a parallel mode that's not being deployed yet. Uh, but we've seen enormous amount of value using these tools, uh, you know, working with our airports and our systems operations. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's move in now to, well, and I also was just reminding myself to to speak to the audience and, and remind people that if you're just joining us, I'm Mary Fran Johnson, Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG, and I'm here talking with Ish Sundaram, who is the Executive VP and the Chief Digital and Technology Officer at JetBlue. And we've been getting lots of great questions from the audience, so if you have something that has suddenly leapt to mind as you're listening to us, please uh, do put it in the comments field and send it in. We'll, we'll see if I can get it in front of Ish. Lo, let me circle back um, and ask you about uh, a topic that I always end up talking with CIOs about, and it's talent acquisition and retention. Um, it's just there is whatever strategies you use to build up the internal tech knowledge at the company and all that, and I know you have a lot of – one of the things you've said in the past about it is people talk about finding curious learners – but are you, are you actually hiring them on your IT team? And by, and by curious learners, you mean people that are not necessarily computer science graduates. They might have liberal arts backgrounds and that sort of thing. Talk about your talent strategy a little bit and, and how that has been changing of late. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind when, when we think about talent is, uh, are you running a great company that people want to come and work for? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when you think about a company like JetBlue, I've been here for eight years now. Uh, it's absolutely a fun company to work for. Uh, when you think about our value, safety, caring, integrity, passion, and fun, uh, you know, every aspect of our value, we take it very serious. And, and no wonder our company has the highest engagement scores. And, you know, year after year, when you think about engagement scores of 90 plus, uh, it shows, you know, the, 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 the background of this company. Um, with that said, uh, you know, talent acquisition is very important, but talent retention is also even more important. We want to make sure that people enjoy their job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just a job, it's a career. Um, a lot of people here uh, value this as a longstanding career, not just in the technology department, but across the 20, 22,000 crew members we have. Specific to technology, uh, the biggest opportunity we have is, you know, how quickly can we change? Uh, to, uh, to leverage new generation technologies and, and that keeps people you know, energized and excited. And as you can see, the continuous investment, whether it's the core technologies or when you think about our ventures and travel products, it's just given so much opportunities for new people to come in, but also the existing people like the crew members, we have to learn new things and, and, and you know, keep up with the pace of the change that's happening in, in the space. Uh, and, and we are very global in terms of our talent outlook. We have people in mm. India, we have people in Krakow, we have people in Dublin. Uh, whether it's through our partners or through JetBlue, uh, you know, we have been very fortunate to have one of the best and the brightest and most passionate talent in, in this company. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the programs that we talked about that I, I thought was unique and I hadn't heard about it anywhere else was the JetBlue Scholars Program. Tell me about that. Yeah, when you when you think about an industry like uh, aviation, uh, you know, with mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcies, um, you know, uh, this is a tough industry where seniority plays a huge role in um, in uh, in how people build their career. Um, so, you know, JetBlue has been always thinking about uh, you know carrying as a great value, but also giving an opportunity for our crew members to learn. So JetBlue Scholars was uh, built by our president of uh, the ventures, Bonnie Simi, who also was leading our talent in the past, and, and now she heads the ventures. Uh, uh, Bonnie's idea was to come up with a internal program in partnership with uh, certain universities to provide absolutely the lowest cost college degree uh, affordable to our, um, our crew members. Many of our crew members have done certain you know, amount of college credits, um, you know, more than a thousand crew members, uh, ha, you know, have uh, gotten about 185 degrees so far. 
uh, more thousand crew members have enrolled, about 185 have graduated with degrees. What it basically does is for about a minimum cost of you know, 500 to $1,000, uh, you can take your existing credits from the past, uh, earn credits uh, through an online program, and also build credits through your work experience. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in roughly two to three years, you earn a college degree uh, in, in different fields. We recently introduced uh, degrees in computer science. Uh, we have even officers who couldn't finish their college degree ended up finishing it recently. So okay. it's a great program. It doesn't cost anything. Unlike unlike many companies that they say they give you know five hundred dollars, thousand dollars of credit, mm -hmm. we actually give them a whole degree for that price uh, in two to three years. <laughs> well, I know you have a master's in transportation management. Are you ha have you got any plans to pick up another degree in anything too? <laughs> I would, I would love to do that. We still haven't started any uh, master's program, and that's something we've been asking uh, yeah. asking for a while. <laughs> well, I, we have another question from our eager audience here, and it's about thinking about enhancing the customer experience and making sure you're hitting all the compliance regulations and better digital presence. Um, how do you plan to leverage immersive solutions like in augmented and virtual reality? This is probably something you yeah. have going on in your innovation labs. <laughs> A, a lot of a uh, lot of these technologies have not come into a mature state for us to uh, leverage. We're definitely uh, looking at uh, in the maintenance side uh, some of these technologies, but also in our customer experience side some of these technologies. Uh, but but we we you know we take uh, compliance very serious, whether it's uh, ADA or privacy mm -hmm. laws. Uh, we work through with agencies to make sure that, uh, you know, all these required compliance, you know, needs are taken care of, but also start driving a lot of innovation with new generation technologies that's available for us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, my final question in our last minute or two here, um, one of the quotes that, that you has been attributed to you, and I think in one of the many interviews, you talk about the CIO of the future being the chief influence officer, and that's what CIO comes to mean, and that that's a lot about how your organization is influencing the customer experience. Just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how you developed yourself into chief influence officer. What kind of advice do you have for other CIOs that are listening that would also like to have yeah. CIO come to mean that? It's uh, it's interesting when, when you know when I look back at my career, um, you know the, the number one thing I enjoyed was asking the question, right? Like having that curiosity to know, you know, how you can how you can influence something and how you can change the way things are done. Mm -hmm. My uh, my first uh, interview with uh, JetBlue with uh, John Agarity, uh, she said, if you come into this industry, what would you do different tomorrow? I said, why check-in? You know, uh, if you look wow. back at check-in, um, you know, uh, check-in started when computers uh, were not there in, in the industry and people had to show up at a, at a counter to show that they are present. Mm -hmm. And that's how check-in started in today's day and age. Like you shouldn't have check-in, you shouldn't have boarding passes, you shouldn't have backpacks. Mm -hmm. And we are slowly eliminating that. And, and when you think about it, uh, you know, I go back to this, uh, having that curiosity, having the the interest to learn new things is what drives uh, this role to be successful. And this is a fast changing, you know, uh, industry and, 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 and you have to have both. Yes. Yes, I agree. And as you go forward into the rest of 2019 and 2020, what is the, beyond improving the customer experience, what would you mark out as kind of the most significant uh, the most significant project or program that IT will deliver to JetBlue? Listen, uh, you know, we always say our number one objective is to keep this airline safe and secure. Okay. And, and we continue mm -hmm. doing this day in and day out. Uh, and this is a challenging industry. And, uh, and, and driving uh, our crew member satisfaction is absolutely a top priority for us, whether it's... Uh, IT crew member or airport crew member, and and um, you know, if we can do those two things successfully, I think our customers will be extremely happy mm -hmm. and uh, delighted to travel with us, and uh, we we don't want to shift our focus from that. Okay, 
Well, thank you so much for your time today, Ish. It was wonderful talking with you, as it always is. And you, I've always got so much going on. So I really appreciate a very busy CIO taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks Mayor so much. Friend, again, uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's a great honor to be here with you. And, uh, and thank you again for everyone for listening. Yes, exactly. Now, if you would like to see more CIO Leadership Live interviews, be sure to follow CIO Online on LinkedIn and Twitter and subscribe to our IDG Tech Talk on the YouTube channel. And now, as of today, we're also streaming on the CIO page on LinkedIn. And our next upcoming CIO Leadership Live will be on October 23rd when I will be talking with CIO David Bayen of Lazy Boy. And so I hope you can join us for that one. And thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks especially for all those great questions that came in from the audience. Take care.